Well, today we're in John chapter 14, still. We're in a chapter that talks all about comfort, still. And we're still in the night that Jesus will be arrested and taken to a mock trial. We're working towards that direction right now. We're in John chapter 14 and verse 20 tonight, or this morning. We're continuing our Comforter series here, and we started with the Supernatural Helper. Remember that? The Holy Spirit. Last week, we talked about the supernatural life. This week, we're going to talk about a supernatural relationship. Remember, Jesus is comforting the disciples. He told them that he's going away, and he's telling them here in the, the end of this chapter five different things that are supernatural that will comfort them and help them to carry on the work that Jesus Christ started here on earth. So, if you are able and willing, I would ask that you stand for the reading of God's Word. We're going to be in John chapter 14, starting at verse 20 today. It says, In that day... You will know that I am, in, I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. There is the supernatural relationship right there. It doesn't make sense to us, does it? But it's there. It says, I'm in the Father, you're in me, and I'm in you. That's supernatural. We can't do that on our own, can we? It goes on, verse 21. <clears throat> Whoever has my commandments and keeps them... He it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Verse 22, Judas, not Iscariot, the other Judas, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for the passage today, and I thank you for the message that it has for me, the message that it has for the church today, and the message that it had for the disciples that very day when you spoke it to them personally. Lord, I pray as we just enter into a time of, of looking at your word this morning, that you would just help us to put the distractions around us of the season aside for just a moment and just focus on you for a few short moments. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, you can be seated. So first, Jesus links obedience to love. Doesn't that sound familiar? That's exactly how he started the last passage. The one we covered last week. He first started by leaking obedience to love. Isn't that an example of what we saw last week in baptism? What is baptism? It's obedience, right? Nothing magical happens in the water, does it? No, there, there could be cockroaches floating around in there. You don't know. We know because we looked, <laughs> but there weren't. Good job, Darren Henry. Where's he at? He takes care of all of that for us, and I appreciate that effort. We, we did a little baptizing this week, didn't we, during the week? And, and he had that water so hot. Oh, my goodness. We were sweating by the time we got out of there. But I appreciate what he does for us there. But Jesus says obedience and love go together. That's what baptism last week was all about. It was about obedience. It was about Hayden taking that first step of obedience. It's one thing for us to give our life to Christ. It's another to do what he says, to actually follow through. And Jesus says that baptism is the first step of obedience. Some of us, we've been saved for years, never been baptized. Well, I'm scared. I'm scared of the water. You'll be okay. You get in the water at least once a month, right? Hopefully it was last night. If you're sitting next to them, you know, hopefully it was last night that they got under the water. 
But some of us, we don't ever take that first step of obedience, but we say we love the Lord. And here, Jesus again starts with linking obedience and love. We can say we love him, but if we don't do what he says, then there's no evidence of that love. Look at what he says there in verse 21 again. The first part of verse 21. Whoever has, whoever has my commandments and what? keeps them whoever has my commandments oh well i own the bible i have them so therefore i love the lord that's what that verse says right yeah that's what it says as long as you leave out the words and keeps them it's the and keeps them part that's difficult isn't it last year we read through the bible some of you are still working on that and you've still got time we're not at the end of the year yet some of you have already finished at least you did it twice right i talked to that individual that's awesome next year we're going to do it a little bit different and I'll, I'll share some links with you and for those of you that like to read it on your your give on, not on your giving app but on your app on your phone the the you version app because next year we're going to read it all the way through again but we're going to do it chronologically instead of going four plus one for some of us, that got us through it, but it was a little confusing when we transitioned from one to the next, and we forgot what we read yesterday, and it was a little confusing. So this year, we're going to do it a little bit different, and we're going to start on January 1st. I won't be here to remind you on the 1st, so I'm telling you now. Next week, we'll try to have that, uh, the link to that one up in the e-bulletin and on the pre-service slides and everything, and we'll share that with you again but that will be different for you because you're going to go somewhat in the order that it's written, but you're going to have to skip around a little bit because we're going to try to stay to as close as we can to the chronological order in the, the, the way that events happen. And that will change the way you read the Bible. But some of you read it and did nothing with what it said. Is that helpful? It's not. We just get to the end of the year and we just check a box and say, I did it. Post on social media. Woo! Read through the Bible. I don't know what it said. I didn't do anything about it. So, but I love Jesus. It's just the obedience part that Jesus himself keeps linking in John chapter 14 that I have a problem with. Right? It's always the obedience part. The having it is easy. You can go to any bookstore and for about six bucks, you can, get the, you can get his word, right? You can walk in the office and we can give you one for free. But the obedience part is what God holds us to, right? We can see that all over in scripture where, where people say one thing and their actions speak differently. Isn't that what Jesus was talking about in the Sermon on the Mount, John, or Matthew chapter 7? Where he says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, I sang in the choir, I picked up trash, I decorated for Christmas, I did all these things. And Jesus says, then I'll have to tell you, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. I saw your social media post at the end of the year that you read through the Bible. I saw that the following year that you, you read it chronologically. Great job. I saw the next year, I've got a big challenge for you. And I'm not letting that cat out of the bag yet because it'll scare you. We're not going to read the Bible entirely through, not this January, but next. We're going to do something different. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but it's going to be tough. But I've seen thousands of people do it, so you can do it. Some of you are going to look at it and you're going to be like, nope, not me. Checking out. I'll pray for you this year. As we prepare for that, it's going to be good. <laughs> oh, I pray for you. And where are you at? I heard your voice. There it is. I was like, I can't find him. He wasn't wearing black. He wore green today. But I pray for you and everyone around you daily because I know you, Matt. <laughs> but doing something about what we read is what's more important, isn't it? 
giving our life to Christ is just the first step. Step, and then everything you do from then on is the next steps, right? There's no store-bought cookies recipe for that, is there? You just got to do it. When we read it, we got to read through next year. Chronologically, we ought to look for opportunities to actually do what he's asking us to do. Not just check a box. Not just say, woohoo, I did it. I did it last year. I did it this year. Uh, I'm going to do it three times this year. Nope. I'm going to look for opportunities to actually do what it's asking me to do. That's when we get credit for it, isn't it? Reading it is not enough. Jesus links the two, obedience and love, together here. Now, <clears throat> the first part of that verse, <clears throat> the first part of that verse says, verse 21, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. Doesn't that sound familiar? That's not the first time we've seen that, is it? That's not the first time we've heard it. Look up at verse 12. That's, that's a passage we've already covered. Look at the first part of verse 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Isn't that the same phrase that he just repeated here in verse 21? Look up, look down at verse 15. If you love me, you'll just say it. That's not what it says, is it? If you love me, you'll read all the way through the Bible chronologically every year for the rest of your life. It doesn't say that, does it? It says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. He's already said it twice in this very chapter. Before we get to our passage here in verse 21, he's going to say it again if you look down at verse 23. And he's going he's to set the example for us in verse 31. And then he's going to become the ultimate example in chapter 19 of exactly what he's saying about obedience and love. He's going to do all of that when he goes to the cross. Look at verse 31. But I do as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. We're not, we're not to that point yet, but are we? He even linked his obedience to love of the Father. He says, it's not, it's not just for you guys. Jesus said, it's for me. He says, I'm not asking you to do anything that I'm not willing to do myself. That's a phrase that I remember my dad repeating as I was growing up. He was in the restaurant business for years. He's a really good cook, and not just in last name, but in like physical, you can eat what he makes, you know? And he would tell his employees that all the time. He would say, I'll never ask you to do anything that I'm not willing to do myself. There's days that he would clean toilets because he asked employees to do that. You know, he, Jesus says here, he says, I'm not asking you to do something and I'm not willing to do myself. He says, there's a link between obedience and love for me. The same way there's a link between obedience and my love for the father. That's what Jesus says. He says, it's for both of them. It's for all of us. It's not just Jesus speaking to the disciples, is it? It's Jesus speaking to you. It's Jesus speaking to me, and he links this love to obedience. If obedience means we look for opportunities to love on other people, then is that not evidence that we love the Father? It is. Every time we get that opportunity to love on someone else, that shows obedience. We look for opportunities. Yesterday, there was 800 ladies at our house. I only sold three vehicles, so get off me, okay? It wasn't that bad. They got a ride. But no, there were like 950 ladies at our house, and when they left, now, I, I got to say, some of you stayed behind and cleaned up, and I'm telling you what, it didn't take 10 minutes to put that house back 
you know, slide furniture back around where it went. It didn't take 10 minutes and we were done. And I'm thinking, poof, horizontal, right? Yeah, I'm thinking, I'm done. I'm off duty. You know, the barn's closed, the doors are locked up, the furniture's back where it goes. We're good to go, right? And then somebody says, oh, they're lighting the tree tonight in Burleson. I don't care. I have a tree, and it's lit up. There's trees all over this place, and they're lit up, and we didn't make a big ceremony out of it. You know, no, I got to drive down there with all them other crazies, and I got to find a place to park, and then I got to walk 8,000 miles to get to the location, and then I get there, and I find out that the tree lighting's not first. I thought we was just going to a tree lighting. Oh, no, there's a parade. I'm still dreaming horizontal, right? Horizontal is where it's at. I like vertical, you know, but horizontal every once in a while, that's what I'm about. And we get there, and I say, okay, well, this is obviously on the parade route, so that's good. We'll wait here. So we found us a place on the parade route. And then I start thinking, where are we on the parade route? Am I at the beginning? Because I can finish this parade quick. Nope. Where you think they put the tree? At the end. So I had to wait 45 minutes after the parade started before it ever showed up. You know, every time I saw one of the policemen riding their bicycle down the road, I'm thinking, that's it, that's the parade. Now let's go. So 7.05, parade's done. We walk over here and we're, we're looking at the, the tree. And I'm thinking, Hopefully, the lighting was supposed to go on at 7, and we're just a few minutes late. So there's this new thing. It's called Google. You can, you can type in there, and it'll tell you answers to stuff. It's pretty cool. So I type into Google, when are they going to light the tree? And it didn't say 7 o'clock. It said 7.30. So now i got 25 more minutes of trying to do something on social media because my phone wasn't operating right, you know, and I'm out there with blinders on. And I'm thinking, I don't need to be looking for an opportunity to love on anybody else. I don't need to be thinking about the obedience part. I just say, on Sunday, I love Jesus, and that should be enough. You should be able to see that, and, and I should be able to take the rest of the week off from loving on people, right? I don't need to be paying attention to what's going on around us, right? In case you're wondering, that they lit the tree. It's just a bunch of white lights. There wasn't even a bulb on it. It was like an hour of my life I'll never get back. I could have got that you know, on social media, a picture that somebody posted and been done and still been horizontal. So anyway, while we're standing there for the parade, I'm like protecting the zone, right? This is our zone. Don't, don't be pushing in on me now. Back off right? And I bump into this guy. We're standing by a steel beam that holds up this sign that goes over that road that's closed there by the square. And I'm like, I'm going to stand next to the beam because then they can't push me out the way, right? I'm not looking for an opportunity to love on somebody. And then I bump onto this dude that's holding the beam up with me. You know, he's on the front of the beam. I'm on the side of the beam, you know, and, and he's holding the beam up. And I notice he's got a Vietnam veteran uh, hat on. And then come to find out, he starts talking to me about, you know, military and about he was a Fort Worth policeman and that he goes to this church over here and this is what he's doing with his time once he's, since he's retired from the uh, Fort Worth Police Department. And I'm like, that's what we should all be doing, right? And we spent the next 30 minutes missing the parade as it went by and talking about the Lord, right? But I didn't start that conversation. He did. Shouldn't I have been looking for the same opportunity that he was looking for? That's obedience. That's, that's doing something with what we did last year in reading through this, is it not? It's you're at a public event with 10,000 people probably not exaggerating that place was packed but shouldn't I be looking for the one that I maybe am there to speak to we should be Jesus talks about that look at this 
in verse 22. Judas, it's not Iscariot. This is how Jesus answers. Because Judas asks a question, but I want you to focus on how Jesus answers here. He says, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. That's comforting, right? I'm like, okay, there's benefit to obedience. Not just is it a step that I need to do to show that I love the father, but the father will love me. And the verse goes on and will come to me. Sometimes that's what you need, right? Come, Lord Jesus. You know, when there were 1,300 ladies at my house yesterday, come, Lord Jesus. You know, if the rapture took place then, I wouldn't have to clean the place up. They would. I'm, no, I'm not. I'm kidding. <laughs> Only a couple of them would, okay? Most of them would go with Sometimes we just need Jesus to be present, right? When life falls apart, knowing that he loves us, knowing that he will come to us, and it gets better. Look on, look, read on. In him and make our home with him. He says, we're going to set up shop in you, in me. When life falls apart, I, mean, I am the very residence of God himself. He says, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to come to you. I'm going to love you because I live there. You can't get away from me. That's better, right? That's a relationship that is supernatural, and that kind of relationship ought to be comforting. It ought to. You can't find that kind of relationship in religion anywhere, even in the religion of of Christianity because if you're in the religion of Christianity then you've got it all wrong you need to be in a relationship with Jesus Christ that's where you find this kind of supernatural relationship and that can be comforting religion is not comforting at all just that relationship with Jesus Christ but Look at this in our last verse. The first part of it, it says, verse 24, whoever does not love me does not keep my words. Not everyone can be comforted by this passage, can they? Not, this is not good news for everyone because there are those that don't love him. There are those that don't keep his words. There are those that will check the box at the end of the year and say, yep, I read it. I don't live any different. I don't act any different. I don't talk any different. I don't love on people any different. But I read it. They don't love Jesus because the obedience is not there. They don't love others. The Bible says those people are condemned. That's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7. He says, you, I never knew you. You claimed to be a believer, but you weren't. I never knew you. That's not comforting. You know, when we start out verse 24 there, that should not be comforting to everyone. If you're not a believer today, I don't care if you're here on campus or if you're watching online. If you're not a believer today, this is not a comfort message for you. This is a message that says that you are condemned, that you're restrained by sin, that sin has won, that you are already on the path that leads to destruction, to eternal separation between you and your Savior, Jesus Christ. He died for you, and you've done nothing with that. You might have read it. You might have heard it from, a, from maybe a junior church worker or a Sunday school teacher or a preacher or someone on TV or the radio. You might have heard it, but if you just heard it, then you just have it in your possession. But you've never done anything with it. You've never stepped to the point from having it to obedience to it, to surrendering your life to it. Look at what how Jesus finishes the remainder of verse 24. And the word that you hear 
the words that Jesus is speaking to them right now that are both comforting and not comforting, they're not mine, but the Father's who sent me. It's God's word that condemns. And sometimes God's word's not comforting. I don't know about you, but when you're reading through scripture, and you, whether you're reading through it all the way in a year, or if you're just reading a passage, you're just doing devotions, is, is it always comforting? It shouldn't be. Because it acts for you and me, it acts like a mirror, doesn't it? And it reflects us. And when I see stuff like, I ought to be loving on other people, and I say, yeah, but I didn't last night, that should not be comforting me. to me. That should be a different C word, right? Convicting. It should be saying, what's the matter with you that you missed that opportunity to love on somebody else? This should be a mirror. And as we read, whether it's in devotions or you're trying to read through a book this month, I, I saw on social media, a few of you are reading through Luke, Luke, you're reading through Luke. There's 25 chapters, is that right? 24, 24 chapters, and you're reading through in preparation for Christmas. That way, by the time you get to Christmas Day, you'll know who it's about. I love that, you know? And when we're reading through Luke like that, getting ready for, for Christmas, it shouldn't all be comforting. Some of it should be convicting right? He, he didn't write this just so we could be comforted every single day of our life. That sometimes in Texas, it's hot. Really? It's hot in Texas? Didn't know that. Read a Bible verse. That'll fix it. That's not going to stop the heat, is it? It's not always going to be comforting. Sometimes it's just going to be a mirror that reflects how you're acting, how you're speaking, how you're treating other people, and that should not be comforting. It should be the opposite. We can't just be comforted by the fact that we know the end of the book, that we know that we have eternal life with Jesus Christ one day. When we breathe our last breath here, we'll breathe our next in his presence. That's comforting. The rest of this talks about sanctification where we're constantly being convicted of the, the, the sin in our life and the change that he requires and the repentance that goes with that and the turning from this direction to go the opposite direction. That's what repentance is about, right? It should not be all comforting. Sometimes life has fallen apart and we go to scripture and we say, okay, God, I just need some comfort. And he didn't give it to us. He gives us a verse like, in that day you will know that I am the Father, in the Father, and you in me and I in you. Whoever has my commandments, like you and me, and keeps them, he says, you're supposed to be obeying. He says, why is it that the only time that you come to me is when life falls apart? What about the rest of the time when I'm just asking for obedience? If he is in the Father, and the Father is in you, and you're in him, you're never without him, right? He's always there as a restrainer for sin in our life. And God's word condemns us when we fail him. When, when we don't love him, when there's no obedience in our life, here's the question. Is there evidence in your life that you love him? Because he links clearly obedience to love. He says, and when obedience is in line, then love is real. And when that is real, there's evidence in your life. And when all of that takes place, you have a supernatural relationship with God. That's big. We always think of God as untouchable. We can't see him. We can't touch him. We can't. He says right here, he lives in you. That's big. You get that in a relationship. You don't get that in religion, right? How many religions do we see in the world where you have to earn your way? The short answer is all of them. 
besides following Jesus. All of them. Every single one. You say, oh, but what about? Nope. Look at it. It's all works-based. Every single one of them. Right? And when we don't follow him, when we don't fall into a, a, a life of obedience to him, not to earn our salvation, but because of our salvation, then that's a problem. That's a red flag. And scripture says that person, God never knew. But when there's evidence in our life, when there's love, when, when we actually do something with what we hear, with what we study, with what we see, that's different. That's when we can enjoy that supernatural relationship of being in the Father and the Father being in us. That's supernatural, and it should be comforting. But is it only comforting to comfort? Remember the context. The context is talking about carrying on the work that Jesus started here. That's why we have a supernatural relationship as believers. Not so that we can just have a better day, right? It's not because of that. It's so that we can have that comfort of knowing that God has not left us stranded. He does not expect us to do something that he's not willing to do himself. He came, he trained for three years, he gave it to the disciples, and now he gives it to you and to me to carry on the work that Jesus Christ started here. That's our job. That's our role. But this season, sometimes, it's so busy. There's so much to do that we don't look for opportunities to love on people. We just think, I got to get my to-do list done, and then everything else will be fine. Some of us sacrifice our time, our efforts, I don't know if you've seen it, but I've seen it already. And, and I think they're going to post some more stuff online from this last weekend. Because they had a, the, the youth all the way down and up had a big event here in the building. And I'm hearing all kinds of good stuff about that event. And I've not even had two seconds to talk to you about it, have I? Not two seconds. I got to speak to Laura and Kent this morning. I got to speak to some of the other leaders that were there. And, and we haven't had time yet to get together on it. But I'm hearing that it was wonderful. Something like 30 kids were here, right? That's awesome. Some of you sacrifice your time for, for the sake of other people. Don't you know some of those leaders that were here on Saturday would have rather been horizontal somewhere? Right? Right? But they sacrifice their time the same way that our junior church workers do and are doing right now as we speak right now, the way our Bible study leaders do every Sunday morning, right? The way our deacons do, the way our, our lay people, there are so many of you in this church that are doing the work of the ministry. There's no way we can do that without you. That's doing it. That's the obedience to the word. That's not just reading through or listening to it on your phone and checking a box at the end of the year and saying, I'm in the, I read the Bible club. Some of you, this year was your first year ever reading all the way through. And you've been believer for decades in some cases. Is that good or bad? I could, I could argue either way, couldn't I? I could say, well, bad on you for not reading it. Really? How many times have you read it and done nothing with it? That's no better, is it? You could read one verse and do something about it, and it be worth more than somebody reading the entire thing six times over and doing nothing. Right? That's what Jesus is talking about. He says, you should be comforted by the fact that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, and I am in you. He says, that kind of supernatural relationship should help you carry on the work that I started here. He left it to the disciples. Now he leaves it to you and to me. Believer, is there evidence in your life 
Are you looking? Do you catch yourself looking for opportunities? Sometimes we do, don't we? Sometimes we only think about this on Sunday. And then we're out in public somewhere, and all of a sudden we see an opportunity to love on somebody, and we're like, oh, I saw that. I noticed it, right? And we get all proud of ourselves for just a moment, and then we find out the preacher sold your car, you know, while you were at an event. That's just how it works sometimes, right? But sometimes we catch ourselves doing that, and that's a good thing. That's evidence. That's obedience. And our obedience proves our love. Giving our life to Christ is just the first step. He actually expects us to live a life of obedience. Not to earn it, but as evidence of it. Are you following the plan? If you're a believer today, are you making a difference? Are you carrying on the work of Christ? If Jesus is in the Father, and you're in Jesus, and Jesus is in you, it ought to be enough. It ought to be enough to encourage us. It ought to be enough to embolden us to share the gospel. It ought to be enough to say, Jesus, I too can be comforted in stepping out of my comfort zone and open up, opening up my mouth and sharing your word with someone who's broken, lost, helpless, hopeless. I should be comforted by that kind of supernatural relationship but what if you're not a believer this provides this passage but Phil I'm going to ask you guys to go ahead and come if you're not a believer today this passage provides no comfort no hope at all does it because there's no obedience and if there's no obedience, then there's no love. And if there's no love, then you too might stand in front of Christ one day and he say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Never. Not even when you were a teacher in, in a Bible study hour. Not even when, when you sang in the choir. Not even when you led music. Not even when, when we did all of that stuff for nothing. Jesus says, there was no obedience. You were building your kingdom. Why do you think when we take the offering, I say something to the effect of, Lord, let this be to build your kingdom, not ours. We don't need the biggest building in Fort Worth. We don't need the fanciest stuff. We just need people to be introduced to Jesus. That's it. If that takes a building and God leads in that direction, then we're going to do that. But if we're just building a kingdom so that we can have the fanciest place in the world, well, then we're missing it. That's not obedience. That's the kind of people that Jesus one day will say, depart from me. You were building your kingdom. I wanted you to build my kingdom. I talked to you about love. I talked to you about obedience. And you just said, no, it's about having the biggest, the best, the greatest of everything. That does nothing. It does no good for anyone. Every dime that's given through this ministry ought to be focused on other people coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and discipling those who've already made that decision. If it's focused on anything else, then it's being misused and mishandled.